Greetings and welcome to In-Depth from DK Rostar. We are going in-depth on labor matters and we're doing so with Kester Nanku, Chairman of the Employers Consultative Association of Trinidad and Tobago. Really looking forward to this conversation. Hello, Mr. Nanko, and we send you greetings on a Labor Day. How are you doing? I am very well. I'm blessed and highly favored. <laughs> very glad to hear. And I know that there are challenges that we always face. But even before we get into some of those things a little locally, what are some of the things that are being reported on by the international labor uh, with, with regard to coming out of challenges coming out of the pandemic? Well, there is one, what I will call the, a foundational piece that informs all of the conversations, the use of social dialogue. The use of social dialogue as the most important vehicle to get parties to where we ought to be. So we talk about getting better, building better, building back better, building better societies, building better communities, and all that is associated with it. So I will say for purposes of this conversation, DK, the ILO con has continuously been speaking over the last two and a half years. Every conversation is focuses on the underlying call to action for social dialogue. And let me go one step further. We are operating in an environment and I'm bringing it from international to local. Where we have been seeing over the last couple of weeks, what I would describe as some confrontational type comments and statements. And almost immediately in reflecting, I'm saying that confrontation is not going to help any one of us. It's not going to help the country. It's not going to help the society. It's not going to help the employer in any way. And this is why I feel convinced that this conversation should be around change and transformation. Why change and transformation? We cannot act on what we are not aware of. But now that we are aware of some of the stark realities that we are currently facing, as a society. As you drill down, it's a fact as we speak today. There are families who do not have food on the table. There are families who as a result of this pandemic would have lost the opportunity to earn an income. Sure, the government has done its best to support and to provide levels of support. But one cannot reasonably expect the government to continue to do that. You have situations where you have, you had families with two, bread, two, two persons employed, and today you just have one. And even that one is finding it difficult to hold on to his or her job. And in addition to that, you find just another fact, sorry, another reality is that people are being asked to go to the supermarkets, to put food on the table, to clothe themselves, to pay their rents and so on with 2005, 2007 salaries and wages. But you got to meet that. And I'm saying all of that because these are some of the realities. The thing is, 
how do we as a tri as tripartite partners, especially as we celebrate Labor Day, how do we get around that? But, does it, but is the tripartite system working as this is constructed? Because you actually see that you would have had uh, unions pull out from that because they said it wasn't working. So where, where do we treat with it now? How do we do that? <laughs> well, and this is why DK, right from the start, I've put on the table for us to achieve the desired outcome or to get to a place where there's a shared common understanding as to what we need to do. You see, change for change and transformation to take place. The first thing is acceptance. Acceptance, acceptance of where we are as a people, where we are as, as the trade union movement, where we are as an employer um, body, where we are as a government. It is recognizing the realities, some of which I have alluded to in terms of, you know, people not being able to put bread on the table, not being able to, you know, to maintain a decent standard of living. And this is why change and transformation is so important. But in order for change and transformation to take place, to your question, answer your question, parties to the conversation must accept where we are. And having accepted where we are, what are some of the things, and you asked about the ILO, and what the ILO has been recommending and speaking to, the use of social dialogue. And social dialogue, the principles of social di dialogue comprise mutual respect for each other, recognizing that one size doesn't fit all, and a desire to come together collaboratively and have meaningful conversations so as to arrive at outcomes that would be in the best interest of us as a people, as a you nation. Know, you see that? qualifier of meaningful conversations i think there's so much that hangs in the balance on those two words meaningful conversation because sometimes i mean we've all fallen short but sometimes it feels as though there is this sort of posturing uh this entrenched position that people are very unwilling to move from and i i don't see how we go where, to where we want to go if we are unwilling to move from individual positions like that without thinking of the betterment of everyone. And you're absolutely correct, DK. You have hit the nail on the head. Because again, as one of the principles of social dialogue, you cannot come to the table holding on to your position. It cannot be about positional bargaining. It has to be, and this is why arriving at, at a common understanding, and this is why the, the, the whole question of acceptance. What are our realities? What are our realities? Do we believe as, as parties to the conversation that these are our realities? So that you're quite right, the, the, the language meaningful and so on is, is really beaten up and overused and whatever it is. What it requires is that parties to the conversation to make that bold decision, that willingness to let go, that willingness to, to let go of the emotional attachment that is being placed on whatever the ideology is in the best interest of moving forward. And we, continue person, speaking, and we continue and we continue speaking about moving forward and change and transformation, looking at ideology, looking at ego. When we return from this break, we're speaking with Keston Nanku, 
chairman of the e of the Employers Consultative Association of Trinidad and Tobago. Stay with us. We'll return with more. Welcome. We are discussing labor matters with Mr. Keston Nanku, the chair of the Employers Consultative Association of Trinidad and Tobago. And Mr. Nanku, you spoke about being willing to move away from a position towards a better end goal for all. And so the person who says, well, just the title of the position that you hold has me a little suspect. How do we know that the employers are giving as much as employees are giving. What do you say to that person? Well, from the employer's perspective, and I'm not speaking on behalf of all employers, but I am speaking on behalf of our membership, that what they can count on from the ECA is speaking the truth, speaking truth to finding a, a resolution to whatever the matter is and encouraging parties to recognize that what is in the best interest of the whole. If we agree that this is where we want to get to, we need to get to, the question is, how do we get there? But we want to get there by speaking truth to the, the challenge. And, and, and there's no hiding, you know? It's difficult to hide because you spoke about meaningful. You just put on the table. How would someone know that from an employer's perspective that the employer is speaking truth to it? And I am saying that, and I will continue to say that the work that we do as at the ECA is about speaking truth and giving to our customers, our clients, yeah, what is in their best interest. And what is in their best interest, some people may, may say, well, you know, this is not in my best interest. I want to do so and so. We have been around long enough and we have the experience in the business to provide you with, if you do this, that whole cause and effect. If you do this, this would be the result. If you do that, that would be re the result. Because you see, at the end of the day, Choice, choice is, choice has its con has consequences. And choice is a function of awareness. And this is why I started off by speaking to putting some facts on the table. Choice is a function of awareness. And whatever we choose to do at the end of the day, there are consequences. The consequences may not necessarily be positive, depending on the decision, the, the choice that you make. But I think, again, it's so important for us to recognize that while we have the power to choose, we ought to think through more carefully because we have the information in front of us. We have the data in front of us. So why should, and this is why I also spoke to what we do as an organization is speak truth. Because that truth can be substantiated by the economic realities, by uh, court judgments both here and abroad, both nationally and internationally. I love the fact that you talk about uh, choice being a function of awareness. 
looking at industrial relation guidelines as they are now, uh, where persons writing it may not have been aware of things that would come, such as uh, the, the pandemic that we're in. Uh, do you think that there needs to be some level of revision looking at things or uh, dealing with a further emphasis on health, well-being, how it is we get people to transition into the world of work uh, from, from school, being the output of the, the, the schooling system, how it is we think about schooling being more of a lifelong thing as opposed to, okay, well, I finished school, I'm ready for work now. And even like transitioning out of the system, what are some of those things that you would like to see in terms of tweaks, the way that we deal with industrial relations, the way that we deal with labor? Well, DK, you have touched on a, a big, big topic, something that is very close to my heart. Education and lifelong learning. Education, training, and lifelong learning. Because at the end of the day, building a knowledge-based society, that's where it's gonna come from. That has its tentacles in the whole education system. The model of education, you know, um, things like apprenticeship programs, things like, like um, technical and vocational um, opportunities. DK, our system, our system of education has programmed us to think or to believe that if you don't have a, 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 a first degree or letters behind your name or a three digit IQ, your chances of success in life is significantly reduced. I am here to say to Trinidad and Tobago, that's a lie. And that's one of the things in our model of education that needs serious reforming. Because think about it. When I was growing up, there wasn't anything about vulnerable society or communities. No vulnerable communities, you hear that, that label being used all around the place. Part of that, the, the, that labeling comes from our educated model of education where people believe that if I don't first degree, tertiary level and so on, I, my chances of success is limited. And that's not the case. What about tech voc? Where are the, where are the, before some years ago, Ken, Ken Julian with the Point Lisa's estate, the people who worked there with the skills, the technicians came from John Donaldson or San Fernando Tech or from Chatham Youth Camp. They have all gone. Some of them, God rest their soul, they have passed on, okay? So that is the reason why, that's, that's why, that's one of the, 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 the critical drivers, if we are to come out of the challenges and the issues that we currently face in terms of labor, in terms of skills, development, in terms of retooling, reskilling, we are now operating in a digital age where jobs are going to be lost, where, where individuals require retooling, retraining, upskilling, and as you said at the beginning of the conversation, change and the transformation. Yes. And one of the things I really appreciate is you talking about those IQ and how many things you have behind in terms of the level of the IQ. But the question is, how are we measuring that IQ? How are we putting <laughs> value to skills and competencies? But I think we hold it for this in terms of this conversation. And hopefully we have another one at a later time, uh, convenient it. to you. But we want to thank you very much, Mr. Keston Nanku. And on behalf of the entire TTT News team, this has been In Depth with me, DK Monster. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm.